we're starting with InterSwitch, right? And their financial results from last year. And very interesting stuff. Um, Abu Bakr, what really stood out? What were those, those things that stood out in that financial report for you? Yeah, I guess the, the, the first thing that I found interesting was the fact, the, the size of the company, the revenue uh, in particular. Um, over the last couple of years, like people have speculated at, at how large InterSwitch could look like. Uh, maybe it's a trillion dollar, um, you know, it's a trillion dollar business and stuff like that. Um, but now we have definitive information that it is not a trillion naira business yet, but it's high growing. Um, it's it's a high growth business. It's okay. grown revenue 23% over the last, um, up to March 2023. And so that's interesting on the one hand. Um, other things that I found interesting um, is that this business is profitable, uh, which is something that you do not see mm. often in the fintech space or in, even in the startup space um, generally. Um, but it's been profitable for a long time, like I think relatively since 2020, 2019, um, it's posted profits according to the reports that we've seen. Um, and so that's also interesting. Um, other thing that I found to be fascinating is um, the fact that a significant chunk of his revenue still comes from Nigeria. Um, we've always seen InterSwitch with its various business units like Verve, the card business as a behemoth that covers the African continent um, entirely. Mm -hmm. um, but for some mm -hmm. reasons, this business still has limited footprints. It has a, lot, a large footprint outside of Nigeria, but for some reasons, um, the bulk of its revenue still comes from Nigeria. Um, although the business is expanding, um, they recently scooped up the rest of the um, ownership shares in their East Africa business. Um, basically, what that does is it gives them the right to incorporate the full revenue for InterSwitch East Africa as part of you know the InterSwitch Holdings um, full revenue. So maybe we'll get to see more of the um, mm -hmm. you know performance in East Africa, uh, and, and that'll be helpful to contextualize how big this business really is. And um, Okay. Yeah, we've also seen how InterSwitch is expanding into mobile money. They have two businesses um, in this space, um, Mkudi and um, Quickteller, um, which they, they they incorporated as InterSwitch um, Financial Inclusion Services, um, IFIS. Uh, and so now they're merging both businesses into a single unit, which would help them grow faster and mm. become more efficient. Uh, uh, that's how they described it. And I think the last thing is the fact that they expand into telecoms. Like it's not something that we we saw coming, um, but for some yeah. reasons, InterSwitch believes that it needs to expand into telecom services. And so it has scooped up that mobile <clears throat> that mobile virtual um, network operator license from the, um, from the NCC. And so we might get to see an InterSwitch mobile you know, mobile operator, whatever, in the next couple of years or months, um, depending on the timeline for which they are um, going about their product launch. All right. Really interesting stuff, actually. And um, out of those things that really stood out for you, I think um, one interesting thing is, you know, about how we've always perceived InterSwitch as, you know, like you said, probably a trillion dollar company. And I'm wondering, um, what does this now mean for... Um, similar companies in Nigeria, uh, take Flutterwave, for example, um, could that mean that we also, um, does that mean that there could also be a possibility that we've overestimated the size of some other fintechs in Nigeria as well? <laughs> that is an interesting question. I mean, people ask the same question with InterSwitch too. Um, the fact that um, you know, InterSwitch's revenue in, in dollar terms, it seems very small. Okay. Um, yeah. The business looks okay. looks very small. Um, uh, I, I believe um, at the time, the, the business was in uh, um, in current money terms, like, you know, the business did revenue of $6.6 billion and billion era. But in dollar terms, that is just $42, 42 million in today's money. But a year ago, that was $145 million. So when people compare the revenue in today's terms, they believe that um, interest which is overvalued at the billion dollars. But in reality, this business actually, you know, has grown revenue on the one hand, and then its revenue at the time when the report was filed was actually significant. $145 million is not a, you know, it's not truly money. It's really huge um, in the context of Nigeria. Yeah. And so when you think about it in that sense, um, 
at $145 million at the time using exchange rate in March 2023. That is useful context for thinking about what the size of similar businesses could look like. And so um, I expect that other Nigerian businesses, other Nigerian fintechs like Flutterwave, Paystack are also dealing with the same devaluation crunch, which makes their Naira revenue in dollar terms look smaller. But their revenue in Naira terms, strictly in Naira terms, is probably, um, you know, for some business, I've heard that their revenue in Naira terms is probably higher than what InterSwitch is doing or close wow. to what InterSwitch is doing. Wow. So I think I think um, the good thing is InterSwitch revenue gives us a, a, a price point or a, you know, a marker to think about, you know, the... the um, the revenue that we we should expect from fintech similar businesses like InterSwitch, whether it's Flutterwave or OP in some instances, now we have like contextual revenue to work with to think about the size of some of these businesses. Um, you know, people throw around figures weirdly in the Nigerian tech industry. Um, you know about revenue and growth, yeah. um, but now yeah. now when you have hardcore facts. Um, like what InterSwitch has put out there, it makes it simpler and more reasonable for people to think, okay, if InterSwitch is doing um, roughly $6 billion or, you know, six seven billion dollars billionaire rather, then other businesses are probably doing around this figure. And so it helps people to tame their expectations about what kind of revenue they should expect <clears throat> from similar businesses in the space. All right. Thank you very much, um, Abu Bakr. That, that, that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, I, think, I don't know if you have... Um, thoughts based on um, what we think about fintech businesses in Nigeria, but um, if you don't, um, maybe I'm sure you have some interesting things that also stood out for you in that InterSwitch report. I don't know if you could share some of those with us as well. Oh, I mean, I don't exactly have thoughts that are different from what Abu Bakr okay. said for, for how we look at other fintech um, businesses. I mean, I think we've heard some We've had some numbers about Flutterwave's revenue um, in the last few years. I think about supposedly around ninety million dollars. So it kind of tracks with what yeah. um, InterSwitch does. But uh, for what I found interesting would probably be InterSwitch trying to get into telco or or getting into the telco space. Um, they are doing it with an MVNO license, which kind of I mean, okay, just to do a little explanation, um, MVNOs. Uh, they basically lease, uh, lease, uh, will I say, lease uh, broadband from mobile network operators. So MTN, Airtel, Glue, and probably Nine Mobile. They lease from them, and then they <coughs> they resell to other consumers. So why is it interesting to me? Um, I mean, ideally, ordinarily, you don't expect a fintech to go from financial services to so providing telecoms, telecom mm -hmm. uh, telecoms. but I'm also curious as to why they made that decision. Um, InterSwitch has been around for quite some time, about 20-something years, and I like to think that um, if you stay around for that long and you do very well, then you you didn't get there by chance. You've, it's because you've made some good decisions. So I'm not very sure. But in this case, I'm not very sure what they are seeing. Um, I'm not too optimistic. The MVNO license was, it was launched... Um, or, I mean, it became a thing last year, and we have about 30 companies or so that have gotten it. But I'm not really sure that there's a lot of opportunity in that space for mm. any new entrants. Um, of course, you will That's not be. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people, uh, you could disagree, but um, of course, you're not going to be competing with MTN because mm. you're, you're essentially feeding off them, so you can't be competing with them. You're competing with the other 31 uh, companies or so that have the same license. Thankfully, InterSwitch has the, has the highest um, license and they are not, uh, like they, they, they can offer a lot more services. So why do I think the that market is probably not as interesting or as large as people expect? Okay. Um, MTN, probably, MTN has the largest um, coverage right now. And what an MVNO can possibly do is reduce the cost of accessing certain services. Now, whether people would switch from an MTN or an established telco to a cheaper product is left to be seen. Yes, we know that Nigerians are price sensitive, um, but they are not necessarily going to provide you with a, a, a service that is heavily discounted because they have to, um, they have to like, 
make some revenue. So they're not going to provide you with heavily discounted services. So okay. I am not expecting a huge shift <laughs> from the likes of MTN okay. to, let's say, um, Interswitch, for Interswitch. example. Um, now, that's, that's on that. Um, but we also know that, so MVNOs are like more common in the US. And lately, we've seen them try to, they're trying to move away from just depending on the the revenue they make from providing those telecommunication services to value added services. So that suggests that there's sort of a cap on your revenues as an MVNO. You can only do so much, right? So what value added service could InterSwitch possibly come up with? Um, I'm not very sure at this point, but I don't know. I, I don't know. I think I'd like to know what Abu Bakr thinks about this. Um, I, I, I personally... I think I, I disagree with Tim Gozrim, you know, when he says, um, you know, what this license could mean for InterSwitch in terms of um, revenues or how, how basically how big they could get, you know, with this new license. I'd like to know what your thoughts are on this, um, Abu Bakr. Do you th- do you agree with Tim Gozrim? I mean, thanks, Wolu. Um, I think I agree partially. Um, okay. Partially in the sense that um, okay. you know Nigerians are price sensitive, but still they would um, not easily switch telecom brands as easy as we think. But I think there's a lot of opportunities in the space too. Um, when you look at you know the the data filed by you know published by the NCC, for example, you realize that the Nigerian telecom space is essentially a a you know a a three company. Um, um, market right now because Nine Mobile has consistently lost customers since 2017, and it has lost customers on every level, whether it's on porting, on data, on um, on regular mobile services. Mm-hmm. And so basically, it makes it a three horse race. And for anybody who you know customers in the space, it kind of limits the options. And so they are stuck between an MTN, a Glow, and a, an Airtel. And then a far strong, you know. Uh, fourth option is a is a nine mobile, and very few people want to switch to nine mobile right now because speculation is that the the quality of the of their network has degraded significantly, um, which is sad. Uh, and so basically, that leaves three people, three companies in the space. And so if you are an M MN, like an uh, like Intel, which is planning, you're basically going to be riding on the rails of uh, of an established telecom company like MTN, for example, and you are basically expecting that MTN will provide you with top-notch infrastructure for you to reach customers. If that is possible, then the only thing you would need to do as an MNVO in this case would be to market your brand to customers and make them think that it's a new thing, detached from the MTN experience that they already know, detached from the Airtel experience they already know, or a Glue experience. And basically, you're, you're making them feel like they're, they're starting afresh uh, with something more sustainable, with something more, you know, um, with something different. And so from a brand perspective, there seem to be that opportunity that exists that an MNVO could actually um, win yeah. over customers, um, you know, that want to find an alternative to the three biggest players in the space right now. Um, so there, there is there is that mm-hmm. hook. Um, the other hook is um, um, data is growing and growing fast in the country and every the top three telecom companies are benefiting from this growth significantly. And you can see it in their reports, uh, for example, um the data segment of mtn's um, revenue finally you know overtook the voice aspect of it which is airtime and regular phone calls that people make and so now data is overtaking that that aspect and so which means that in the next couple of years um mtn is actually going to be a largely data driven business and so for anybody who's paying attention to this space that creates a lot of opportunity that is that signals again that the infrastructure is robust enough to support um, and MNVOs, it also means that, you know, that there's a lot of things that um, customers are expecting from their telecom service beyond regular voice calls. So I believe that there's still a lot of opportunities there uh, for the right player to step in and figure out the right strategy to reach customers mm-hmm. and to support customers on different levels beyond making voice calls and also providing a different type of revenue beyond the regular airtime income that uh, MTN currently gets or the other three telecom companies currently get. So I, I believe there's a lot of opportunities there. What I do not know is what kind of strategy interest which is looking to get with. Um, their report basically mm-hmm. hints that they want to merge, you know, find the sweet spot between payments and telecoms. 
um, with this MNVO license. But I'm not sure what that entirely means because they can't exactly run a data center, for example. They can't exactly yeah. run, um, you yeah. know, pay points, you know, deploy um, um, POS devices. That doesn't really, that's not really a telecom business that they can deploy, um, run with. So it's a little bit um, confusing or should I say unclear about what this telecom business could look like, but they've spent 500 million now trying to get the license. So the safe bet is that they have a strategy in place and we'll get to know eventually um, what direction they are going to go with uh, when, when this business kicks off. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, only time will tell um, what their strategy is and how exactly they'll um, go about it. Um, well, I think um, one way, another way to look at this would be, um, well, I agree with you, know, you and Tim Gozum, I think another way to look at this would be looking at it through the lens of, um, looking at it outside the telecom space, right? Um, we all know the kind of impact um, telecommunications companies have on, that they've had on the tech ecosystem, right? Um, they be, they, some people will even say um, telecoms companies uh, were the first tech businesses in Nigeria, right? And they literally paved the way for other um, tech companies. Um, well, I think there's still a bit of um, um, there's there's still there's still a group of um, budding um, tech ecosystems within Africa that can benefit from these um, MNVO licenses, um, which is the interesting thing about these licenses because. Um, when you look look at a lot of um, a lot of other um, countries wh- where these licenses are more popular, like Jim Gobzini said in the US, um, the group of people that are able to tap into it, right, um, are usually those segments that the telecoms companies have actually left behind, right, that they've not really been able to offer these services to. So maybe um, it might not be like a super um huge revenue generator for interswitch but um it could actually have a very huge ev- um, effect on the um tech space in general and i don't know maybe you can see more ev- more ecosystems come up as a result of um this license okay um so before we go on to um, the next thing i think it's also important for us to um let our listeners actually understand what MNVO licenses are. MNVO, wait, did I, did I say that correct? MVN. Sorry, MVNO. I've been saying MNVO. <laughs> what MVNO licenses actually are? Um, I think you already explained this, right? Okay. Uh, we, okay. I mean, it's just okay. So, like the data resellers, you, some of us use. Um, okay. So, um, okay. So, mobile network operators like MTN, Glow, Nine Mobile, and Airtel. They have like specific bandwidth that they typically can't use, but it's not like okay. Let's say you need a hundred. Um, let's say you need like hundred units, for example. Um, you're not just going to buy hundred units. You need to buy more than that. It's um, like it's common practice for them, so they will typically buy more than that. Mm. And you have like some excess bandwidth that you're not exactly doing anything with. So with MVNOs, they what they now do is that. They are basically leasing it out or selling it to MVNOs who can now offer the same services that they offer to um, customers. Okay. So I think for Nigeria's case, um, this license kind of mandates them to put a lot of their services in rural areas, which is why I'm also not very optimistic <laughs> about it. Because I see. in the rural areas, um, MTN, for example, has really good coverage in rural areas, right? So if MTN has really good coverage, um, I don't know. Would they really? Would people really switch? But like Abu Bakr said, it's your job to like market to those people, and hopefully they switch. But the fact that they are being encouraged to spend like a lot of that, um, a lot of their like basically encouraged to target the rural areas heavily. I'm not exactly um, well, sure, but I've, uh, let's see. I've I've a different mindset about it. So I think. I mean, the whole point of an MVNO license means that you can offer these services but without spending the amount of money that MNOs like MTN have spent on infrastructure, Yes. basically. So I think that kind of gives you room to be more agile than um, MNOs, right? 
it gives you room to be more agile. It gives you room to um, give very, very competitive prices, right? To offer those services at very competitive prices, which again is also dependent on on the tier of license you have, right? But I think with that advantage, that major because these infrastructures are like one of the probably so, some of the biggest expenses by these telcos, right? Mm. I mean, MTNs. Um, we we're talking about NTN last in the last podcast and how much they lost, how much did the devaluation cost them because a lot of their um, do- expenses. towers yeah. ep- expenses are in dollars, mm. right? So if InterSwitch doesn't have that problem, if other uh, firms with MVNO licenses don't have that issue where they have to now start setting up infrastructure and they don't, they don't have to spend that much money, I think maybe those competitive prices would be a significant um, competitive edge for them. I mean, that's the hope, yeah. Mm. But I just, so I'm just thinking about um, our local cloud services provider or, or local, let's say, web hosting providers, mm. right? Um, in a way, they are using a similar model. Mm. Uh, most of them are not, they don't have the capacity to like offer this, like they don't have the infrastructure for some of the services that they offer. So they're either buying um, from, they're either renting servers from foreign companies or something like that. And one of the biggest complaints has always been the quality of service. And I remember, I think last year or two years ago, when Hugo was, oh, well, now Go54, okay. um, former CEO was um, speaking with us, he mentioned that the problem is the quality of their service is at the mercy of the quality of service of the of the um of their partners. Oh, okay. So if your third party um if your third party provide service provider is if they don't have like really good services, you really can't do better than them. Mm. So that's the biggest problem. And so in the last few months mm. we've had almost all I think all all, all service um all um telcos we've had major issues with the quality of service. Your I think MTN at some point had to um, I think they suffered fiber uh, fiber damage yes, or something yes, like that. Yes, yeah. Yeah, we don't know what happened with Airtel and maybe Glow, mm. but we are sure of what happened with MTN and the quality of their service has been bad for quite some time. Mm. So I, the fact that they, these guys are at the mercy of the MNUs makes me less co- or makes me cautious because, I mean, if MTN doesn't do well, if they are down for a day, you're down, mm. and your customers do not. They probably would not know that you're getting your services from a third party mm-hmm. and really they don't care <laughs> and they are going to you're going to be uh, you're going to get all the blame so um, if MTN services for example improve then if you get from MTN of course you do better but like okay. I mean let's right. see what happens over the next few months yeah so uh, um, Abu Bakr I understand um, you can't join us um, throughout the podcast so I don't know if you have um, time for one more question yeah sure sure okay all right, so um, I just want to um, touch on um, InterSwitch, their earnings, and how the devaluation of the Naira really impacted it. So what I want to know is, um, for example, like I said, last week we were talking about MTN. And, you know, while some of their expenses were in dollars, right, it really affected, and they earned in Naira, right, it really affected um, their revenue, right? I think they lost about 760 billion Naira or so. Um, just due to that narrow devaluation. So I want to know um, how does this devaluation really impact um, InterSwitch um, based on the kind of cost, right, for them that is in dollars? Do they have, is it just as bad as what we saw with MTN or is just that when they convert their earnings to dollars, it's just lower. Is that the only issue they have, or does it go beyond that? I think it's I think it's both problems. Um, when you look at InterSwitch's earnings, um, there are a couple of main takeaways. The first is um, their gross margin. Their gross margin is relatively high. They're doing like um, they've consistently maintained eighty eight percent gross margin. Um, you know, on 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 their business, which basically means that it costs them. Um, their cost of selling, um, you know, interest-rate services, whether it's their mobile money business or their their card payments, all of it is fairly low on a cost basis. Where they have a problem okay. is the expenses, um, the rest of the expenses, you know, the operational expenses, like um, 
several mm-hmm. components of it. Um, okay. It could be priced in dollars. And so that actually eats into their profits. Mm-hmm. Revenue is growing, which is a good thing, but profits is declining because they're not able to make as much money as they should um, because they are spending mm-hmm. all this money on you know, operating their business to keep it alive. And so that has been the main challenge for businesses like interest rates. Like you have all this cost, like you mentioned, in dollars. Um, you also have to pay your employees uh, at a rate that you know matches up to or is higher than inflation, and so you know, or else you lose talent. And so you have all of these challenges you have to keep up with, and so that impacts your revenue significantly, or not rather your profits. And so what you end up realizing, like even with the case of MTN, is revenue is high, it continues to grow, but your net profit continues to decline because you just have to spend, you know, a good chunk of your revenue on maintaining your cost on keeping your cost um on you know servicing your your, the rest of your business and so that's where the main challenge is um revenue is doing well revenue is on the high side profits is declining because you are being squeezed on an operating basis and so that's the that's the challenge that business like um interswitch and mtn are facing um but you know also you realize that this business uh they have foreign investors and so their investors have yeah, investors are paying attention to to their to the revenue. Um, you know, the investors are all private guys and they've marked up the value of this company on a dollar basis. And so when they have to now evaluate how this business performed in 2024, for example, they are gonna use present money rate, that's the dollar rate. And that in a sense is it's gonna devalue this company like maybe you know, devalue their revenue by seven percent thereabouts. And so when you have to deal yeah. with that kind of situation from an international investment investor perspective, um, it's not very, it's not rosy. It's not, you know, it's not a good idea. It's not, it's not, it's not as positive as you expect. But on the whole, if the investor is comfortable with the realities of investing in an emerging market like Nigeria, these are the kind of things you have to expect. You have to expect devaluation. You have to expect that in terms of dollar um, revenue, this business is not going to look as exciting as you expect. Uh, but you know everybody is pinning their hopes on this very nifty thing, which is the exchange rate. And if that picks up, dollar revenue for InterSwitch would pick up too. If it goes down, dollar revenue for InterSwitch would go down too. So that is something that investors have to get comfortable with. And I believe um, the guys like Visa, for example, have priced this in way back since 2019. They've already estimated that if InterSwitch grows to whatever revenue it gets to by 2023 or 2024, what would their um, their revenue run rate look like? You know, what would their their multiples, revenue multiples look like? And would they be comfortable with whatever multiple they get five years down the line? Um, by 2023, March, when InterSwitch filed this report or when this report was ended, it looked like um, Visa had good reasons to price the, the company the way they did. Like it was, you know, revenue was around seven times evaluation with the current exchange rates it's 24 24 times its current revenue uh, current valuation so these are all the values that international investors have to take into cognizance when they invest in businesses and it can dent investor confidence when you look at markets like this or it can also create opportunities for you know um, faster growth in the future because um, this business are able to take advantage of yeah. the growth domestically and just leapfrog whatever innovation already, already exists. Um, but you know that that's where the challenge is. Um, everybody is hoping that at some point uh, the macroeconomic um, environment for Nigeria would improve, and the businesses that have been able to take advantage of the weaknesses in the market for a while will benefit of that growth eventually. Yeah, thank you very much, Abubakar. Um, that that um, that makes a lot of sense. I think investors. Or should I say, people in the tech ecosystem in Nigeria, I think now they have like two major prayer points. It's um, for investors to be comfortable with <laughs> uh, knowing that the Naira could keep falling or for them to pray that um, the Naira gains against the dollar. Um, I don't know which one is more likely to happen, but it's a real problem. And I hope we find a solution to it. Jim, do you think investors will be comfortable with thinking that, okay, if I'm investing in Nigeria, I have to be comfortable with the fact that my returns will be low due to the exchange rate. Do you think that's something <laughs> investors will have at the back of their mind? 
businesses are ex- exiting Nigeria, so obviously they are not very comfortable with it. Mm. But some people would be. So I guess the people who stay back either get burnt or they would get to make lots of money. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Amubaka. Um, thank you for the time. Um, it's been a pleasure having you and uh, very insightful um, comments by you. Um, we hope to have you um, some other time. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Have, have a lovely day. You too. All right. To listen to the full episode of this podcast, visit podcast.techpoint.africa or search for Techpoint Africa podcast on your favorite podcast platforms. Thank you.